got a very special guest with us, and we're going to be talking about um, iconic brands and shifting up a gear. Um, for those of, those, of those of you who don't know me, my name is Nick Butcher, and I'm from Ignition Human Performance. And Ignition, uh, we do uh, learning and development a bit differently because we use lessons from motorsport and the automotive world. And today, um, our guest very much comes from that world, um, having worked uh, on shows such as Top Gear and the Channel 4 Formula One coverage. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Jim Wiseman. And then we also have Simon Charles, who's the founder of Charlesy um, and has worked with uh, British touring car teams as well as a wealth of other, um, other businesses. So um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce you both, James and Simon. How are you doing? Good, good. Good morning. Good morning. So, Jim, why don't you uh, just give a bit of information uh, about yourself, uh, sort of your background, and and what you've been, what you've worked on, and and what you're currently working on. Yeah, I'm um, basically a producer director, uh, and I've kind of been fortunate enough to work across quite a lot of um, motoring content. So as you said, Top Gear, um, Formula One, and I currently make a program called The Car Years, which went out last night on ITV4. Um, and uh, I'm lucky enough to work for a few brands as well. As you, as you might have seen in the show reel, worked for, working on and off for Red Bull, Lotus, Ferrari, Pirelli, uh, Haas as well um, so yeah I've been very fortunate and um, it's been an experience and um, to work with these teams uh, which you know you, you, you have to work efficiently so um, hopefully that will help today. <laughs> absolutely absolutely and uh, over to you Simon why don't you give us a bit of uh, your background um, and what, what you're currently working on at the moment. Sure. So um, I'm Simon Charles. As you say, I currently run Chelsea, which is a, a digital marketing and media agency. Uh, my background was actually all in retail. Um, so I spent nine years working for the Theatre Features Retail Group. So you may know kind of Ryman Stationery, Who Avenue, Robert Dias. So uh, that, that, you know, that standard mix of hardware, stationery uh, and lingerie. Uh, it's a bit of, bit of a plethora of uh, businesses. Um, and in those kind of in those nine years, I hold a num held a number of roles, um, mainly across marketing and commercial functions. You know, some of the most interesting, and relevant I'll be talking today uh, were running um, Theo Peters' Dragon's Den investments, which is quite fun. Uh, but then also um, running kind of a commercial department that our company heads team over at Ryman as well, focusing on e-commerce marketing um, and direct sales. Um, so. I can talk a little bit about those um, and also, uh, yeah, the last year or so of starting up my own business um, and what it is I do uh, for some of my clients at the moment. Brilliant. Fantastic. So it's going to be a really uh, good, wide ranging chat today looking at iconic brands. And I suppose coming to you, Jim, uh, probably working on Top Gear in the last 20 years, probably I would say is up there as one of the biggest TV brands there has been. Um, but let's go back 20 years because it was, wasn't was like that. Um, I seem to remember sort of back in the early 2000s, we had old top gear had gone, fifth gear had come in. Um, how, how did you get involved with, with, with the show and how did, how did it sort of become an idea again? Yeah, it was it was a funny one. I, I was I was quite fortunate in a way because I <clears throat> I was a runner, which is obviously making cups of tea and uh, a lot of tea making. Running is, and I'd, I'd done that on um, Jeremy Clarkson had a chat show. If you're old enough to remember, and I was a runner on that. And I remember uh, when Top Gear got axed. Obviously, that we, we were all shocked in the office, and Jeremy particularly, and um, another guy who he works with a lot, Andy Wilman, was also on that production. And so fast forward, but I think it was probably about six months later, I'd, I'd, I'd then gone on to work on a um, panel show, uh, They Think It's All Over, um, during that period, and learned a lot then. 
uh, and um, then the opportunity came up and I was a massive Top Gear fan. It was, it was Tiff, Quentin and, um, and Jeremy and I've been lucky enough to work with all three of them. And um, so I was like, this is my dream job. And so when I got the opportunity to interview, it was, it was, a, it was a massive thing. I was 24 or whatever, you know, and um, it, yeah, it was huge. And, um, and I got it um, because I just went for broke in the interview. I, I did Jeremy impressions. I tried to be different from, because I asked the person who was taking me to the interview, it's like, oh, how many people have you seen for this role? It was a researcher's role. And she was like, oh yeah, we saw, you know, 30 people yesterday and we've got another 20, you know, and you're just like, oh, well, the numbers are against me here. I'm just going to have to go shit or bust essentially <laughs> you know and um and so I did and I got it and um I was obviously over the moon but of course that's just where the work began you know it was kind of as with all big things like this uh, but but it seemed very natural looking back it did seem very natural the way that so the previous show had kind of got into a rut and they got rid of it they axed it Who's to axed it because it was it wasn't doing the numbers that it was, and so it seemed very natural. And having come from a kind of entertainment, I've done a few game shows as well, and from an entertainment background, it was kind of like, well, it's too serious. We need to be more entertainment, if you like. So the whole idea of having a studio was there from the beginning. Um, in fact, when, when I went to the interview, I had to submit like five studio ideas and five uh, VT ideas. So, um, so the studio bit, I was quite, I felt I was stronger at than some of the other people because I'd done a lot of studio things. So it seemed natural that it needed to be like that. And I remember really early on, Andy Wilman, who's obviously empresario of Grand Tour now, um, asking me the question, asking us, there's a few of us who started as a core group. Oh, do you think the celebrity should do a lap of the track? Because the idea was always to have a track. It's like, yeah, absolutely. I, I just remember going, yeah, of course, <laughs> you know. But at the time, and, and you don't realize all these big decisions then yeah. kind of culturally a thing. So my first job really was to was to find a complex that could house a studio and a track. And I remember going around various places. I remember North Weald in Essex was one option. They used to film Crystal Maze in a hangar there back in the day. And there's obviously an airstrip there. It's an old RAF airstrip. I remember going there and a few other places all around the country. And then we, we arrived at Dunsfold and Dunsfold had only just been mothballed, uh, I think two years earlier. And made the Harrier jump jet there. And so the, the, the runway and facility there had only just been resurfaced. I think it was resurfaced in 1998, and we're talking 2002, long time ago now. But um, so it was only, it only been resurfaced four years earlier. So it was just ready made, you know, and, and the spray shop there that used to, where they used to spray the, the, the um, Harrier jump jets had a false roof, which is obviously perfect for a studio because it, absorb some of the sound so that was perfect that was then that was a thing and then just lots of things happens you know and again we'll talk about it in a moment with rose tinted glasses it's very easy to say these things. but at the time the pressure pressure was on not specifically on me because I was just a researcher but certainly Andy Wilman and Gary Hunter who was the exec there who went on to do SAS are you tough enough and all that kind of stuff he they, they had very much pressure on them. And of course, Jeremy had pressure because the big thing was Jeremy was coming back because he'd left on top here to do chat shows and things. So the pressure was very much on, but there were lots of things, I think, because I had, because I was quite young and kind of enjoying the experience of reinventing this brand that I loved. There were a lot of decisions that were really easy. I remember the a press release came in from from uh, Suzuki and this 
little boxy blue thing and i just thought this is such a terrible car but perfect for for the celeb lab because we were looking for something that was wasn't too powerful so they don't kill themselves and kind of you know and um i just remember waving this photo going this is it this is look at this i said yeah i've said it um, you know, look at this you know it's, it's this is the ideal and the weird things like that where again with the rose tinted glasses on you kind of go this is unbelievable you know or this kind of thing that happened so it was um yeah that's how i got into it sorry long answer yeah no it's, it's incredible all those decisions as you say it's not necessarily that you were sitting there going this is going to be iconic because this is the Suzuki Liana, it was really, this looks terrible, let's do it. Um, and it, yeah, and I, and I can, yeah, I think that's really interesting how actually when you take pressure off yourself to make decisions, or there's just no pressure in the first place, because as you say, there was pressure on Top Gear, but it almost had nothing to lose in terms of, I don't think people, and again, it's going back that sort of 20, 25 years now, 20, 20 years now, sorry, we're not quite there, but 20 years. Um, where uh, you're not actually, yeah, you, you, you're making decisions. The car shows were very different back then. And of course, the format that you guys established then became what we know as car shows now. Of course, at the time, it was more a car review show. So actually, what you were doing was quite, was quite different. Um, yeah, I, I, to be honest, I think it was just, a, it was a really good mix of people. And it was, from my point of view, it was just, um, I know it's a cliche, but it's like, it's just youth, the youth of not having any expectation on yourself. Mm. The guys further up the chain would have had the pressure. And I think that's really interesting from a team point of view. I think we, by chance, perhaps, we absolutely nailed it in that there was some experienced people there at the top. And then there was a decent mix of youth and enthusiasm. And so... I was at the point in my career where I was the youth and enthusiasm. Now I'm at the, you know, feeling the pressure and and <laughs> the further up the chain. But at the same time, you kind of go, well, I need that. I need the youth in as well. So it's, it was a really quite good mix of people. But ultimately, we were all televisual car nerds who wanted to make it work because it was something that we all loved and. To begin with, it didn't gel as you hoped because I think we, we found out it was an absolute behemoth to make television because you went and shot all the VTs and then you had to then do all the studios and the track and it, it was very involved and the team was small, smaller than it is now, so it was... Uh, a huge undertaking and that showed I think I mean the first series w was okay but it wasn't it wasn't brilliant and also Just, it was a change for the audience and I think yeah. change is always always um, very difficult for an audience to get into early on and I'm sure Simon had the same with Dragon's Den in that it was such a it was such a new thing certainly in terms of like business pitching and stuff like that we, we didn't really know about that back then in the same way that on top gear well simon i'm sure you've had similar similar pain yeah yeah and, and on dragon's den but also in business um like there's um uh, i think like you say rose tinted spectacles we all look back at top gear and we thought it just flew uh but uh, there were decisions that didn't go the right way um having that youthful exuberance is a fantastic thing to have because you need to build a culture where people can't be afraid afraid to make mistakes otherwise you'll never get the best decisions out of people uh, i've worked in very entrepreneurial businesses and the key has always been testing and learn test and learn uh, every the moment you stop testing the moment you stop trying to improve you have a problem uh, but to make that work properly, you have to have a culture where people can't be afraid to fail. Now, there's that on one side, but then on the other side is also, look, when you've made a mistake, you need to ensure you never make the same one again. 
uh, you need to f make sure you don't fall into those pitfalls because that's where you know uh, the the mistake can lead to a business that fails. Um, but um, if you can build that environment where people are confident enough uh, to come to the fore with new ideas, then you should one day hit on the right answer as long as you're always testing and learning and testing and learning and double checking your approach every single time. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. Being able to make mistakes uh, and then forget about them is good. I think uh, Nick, uh, earlier on before we got on this call, referred to the Top Gear dog that I think was seen two or three times and then never was never seen again. Uh, so there were clearly some decisions that were being made that uh, never came back. Um, and people forget that, that in, the, in the journey of the brand. I just want to say on the dog, it was adopted by the Hammond family. It, it wasn't. It wasn't put down or anything awful. <laughs> it was. Uh, I, still, I don't know whether it's still alive, but um, yeah, it was living happily in Herefordshire. Put that one to bed as well. It lived a good. It lived, it lived a good life. Don't worry. But I think actually looking at season one of Top Gear, it's actually very very different to the rest of what we. It had different presenters. It had a different colour stick. Um, what what was sort of the decision? How did you sort of sit down at the end of season one and, and make those actually quite crucial decisions to, yeah. to which changed the format quite considerably? Yeah, I, I think we were so lucky because social media hadn't started. This is how long ago now, as you kind of think. What? No one was slating it on Twitter. Um, so it was that long ago that that we were just going on audience figures and general reaction. And the audience figures kind of grew through the series. So that was encouraging. And there were certain things I was, I, I, I was kind of, my thing in those early series was the big stunts. I think in show one, I still remember, I just desperately wanted to have a double decker bus jumping motorcycles, you know, cause it's usually the other way around. And I remember Jeremy being like, really, cause he, they all wanted to make like, you know, good looking car tests. And he was like, oh, this is, this is, nonsense you know and I remember distinctly in the show him going well that's a waste of your license <laughs> I was like, oh, shit. and so but that went down a storm and we did various other things like um silly things we had a bunch of grannies donutting s2000s and things like that so I was doing kind of silly stunts and they seemed to be going down quite well so that was good um so we we kind of you obviously firstly go for the positives and we go well that worked and that worked and that worked and then the presenter change was actually forced upon us by the channel. The channel were just like, bless him, Jason Dore um, was in the first series and we were like, it doesn't work, can you change it? Um, there was pressure on Richard Hammond as well, but we dug in on that and said, no, he seems to be liked by car people, which is important. And so um, that happened. I, see, I, I distinctly remember the day because I got on, I got on, I get on really well with Richard and I was really pleased for him. I remember being really pleased because there was a, you know, dodgy time. Um, and then we, we screen tested James and that went well. Um, and, but I think, you know, again, with the roast into glasses, it didn't fly. Series two was all right. It was an improvement. But we re I really feel series three was the moment we, so we stumbled across two things in series three, which is still done to this day. So we did a hundred pound car challenge, which was drive to Manchester in a hundred pound car. And suddenly there was a, a format within a format that worked. So suddenly it was like, we started then doing cheap Porsches and all that kind of stuff, which people remember. <clears throat> and then the other thing that worked was, and it was something that I set up and was I'm really proud of to this day, which was the, we raced a train against a car. So the new Aston Martin DB9 had come out and we, we raced to Monaco. And that was a big departure because in the first series, it was like, oh, we're going to do everything in the UK. We don't want to go on car launches, all this kind of stuff. And suddenly we did this race and it went down a storm and suddenly that was a thing. So mm -hmm. you think about it, that was probably what was that 2004 so if you think about that that's two years after the initial initial kind of um 
pilot program and finding the venue and all of that. So it doesn't just click into place. You know, it's the rose tinted glasses again. It doesn't click into place. But um, following on from what Simon said, we learned from our mistakes um, and, you, you know, you just don't make them twice. We try not to. And, and kind of, I don't want to, contrary to Simon's thing, yes, we, the, the exuberance of youth in the opening series. And then you, let's be honest, if we did something wrong, we knew about it uh, from the powers that be. So it, it was actually the fear of failure <laughs> that got me through, it got us, which raised the bar culturally within the office. So, um, but that was the moment for me that it kind of came together. And that's when a little golden period, if you like. Um, so did, did you see that in sort of, because originally, I mean, at one point, Top Gear, you couldn't get, you were on about a seven year waiting list to get a ticket into the studio. D did you see that yourselves from sort of, I think the first few series, it was, was it car clubs and even you guys in the background <laughs> trying to fill the space? The first so did you start seeing that sort of yeah, yeah, yeah. In increase? Yeah, in the first series, because we were learning the ropes, and this is the other thing, you know, the studio took ages. Mm. These poor people from the car club, and it's very hot in there in the summer, and it was like, no, we want to go now. We were going, please, can you stay for another half an hour because everyone's leaving, you know? So it was, it was, it was ridiculous. So we ended up, the production crew ended up being, if you think about that now, where, you know, you can't get in for seven years or whatever. But there was very much a seed change, and... The thing I remember most is the second race that we did. Uh, and again, this is kind of pre Twitter and all of that kind of stuff. The second race that we did, I got on the tube to go to work. Um, you know, we used to make it in White City at television, near television centre. So it was on the central line. And I remember getting on the tube on the Monday after it went out and overhearing a conversation between two chaps on the tube talking about the thing that you know, a bust of the gut making that went out the night before. And then that's the moment where you go, oh, God, you know, uh, there are a lot of people watching this now. Um, and, um, yeah, that was, that, was a, that was really the moment, that time, and then, and then you're out filming and you just can't do a piece to camera without a van driver going, e -e -e -e, you know, and it's, you know, at that point, you're kind of in the public consciousness. Yeah. And because also, wasn't that the point where the BBC started asking you for advice on other shows as well? Why, why don't you sort of t talk us into that one? Yeah, they, they suddenly, well, this is, and I'm sure Simon's had the same with Dragon's Den, is if something's successful, and I'm sure this is the same across any industry, if something's successful, then people are trying to latch on to, right, what was it that made us a success? And, and, and um, I think it was quite flattering for the group of us who put it together to be asked, you know, oh, we want to do a trip, we want to do a, you know, we want to reinvent the holiday show. So we got asked to brainstorm ideas for holiday show, which turned into a program called Departure Lounge, um, which didn't do well. It got a nickname Disaster Lounge, which is unfair. But anyway, so we did, um, we, we, yeah, we, we kind of brainstormed some stupid ideas for that to try and make it the same. But ultimately, I think cars and car culture lends itself to the messing about and perhaps travel and other things. I remember... I, I went in for, uh, I remember being pulled into a um, brainstorming session for one man and his dog, you know, I was like, well, we get onboard cameras on the dogs, obviously, you know, all that kind of stuff. And so, you know, you just, it, it's that same thing. I'm sure Simon, you know, I'm sure all stationers come to you and, 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 and also kind of business program ideas. Suddenly you're being asked to, you know, do things with them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and like you say, nothing nothing so clearly matches from one company to another. <laughs> um, yes. Although yeah, as as with Ryman, uh, I would have absolutely loved to uh, be a fly on the wall in an a W. H. Smith uh, board meeting. Uh, you, you can never quite achieve those kind of things. But again, 
everyone has their USP. Everyone has the reason that people come to them. Um, I think as, as a business, you've got to try and define what that is, find your feet and then take it from there. You can learn from other people, uh, but it's never going to match 100% um, unless, you know, you, you end up going from Top Gear to the Grand Tour or uh, something similar. There's, there's evolution. Uh, but, um, uh, yeah, it's, uh, uh, tricky, tricky to take, uh, take a format that's worked elsewhere and just instantly apply it into another industry. You know, there's industry best standards and best practice. Uh, but, um, yeah, your, uh, uh, part of running your own business is finding what makes you special, uh, to your customers and then leveraging it as much as possible. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, no, no, you're, you're absolutely right, Simon. Um, and I think that's really important is about knowing your audience, whether that's in TV or in business. Actually, if you don't know your audience, then you're not going to speak to them. And there's very much that difference between client and customer and fans. And I think that's very much what Top Gear saw was people became fans of the show because and we'll go on to this now in terms of the, the height of success of Top Gear, where it was. Stig merchandise, T-shirts, um, everything. Like, what what was that actually like to, to deal with in the background? Because obviously, then you're putting a pressure on yourself that every series and every adventure has got to be harder than the next one. What how, what was that yeah. like, Jim? Yeah, it was it was really interesting. Um, uh, you know, it's it's a huge distraction from making the program. So making the program is kind of hard enough. And then suddenly, with the risk of sounding like spoiled children, um, you, suddenly all that other stuff is, um, so say for example, you know, you're out filming and then suddenly it's like, oh, can you do this message? Or can you, oh, actually we need to get some, we need to do a trail. Oh, oh can you, you know, so all these, rec suddenly, you know, if you're in demand, it's dealing with all the extra stuff um, I'm going to do it, Nick. The uh, comparison, if I may quote Mr. P. Diddy Coombs, uh, no problems. Um, it is exactly that. You know, it's that kind of. So not only is the there's the there's the pressure of outdoing what you so you get that moment. It's like I had it last night with the car years. I was really pleased with one of the episodes that went out last night, and it got a good reaction, and then you kind of go, okay, how do I top that? You know, last night it was two great car, it was two great supercars from that came out in the same year. It's like a gift, you know, um, it was the James Bond Lotus and the Magnum PI Ferrari. What a gift, they both came out the same year. And, and, and it was the same, it's the same with Top Gear. I remember we did one of the races, which was the Bugatti Veyron and the two lads were in the plane and we had this, stupid race back to London. And I remember thinking after that, well, how does it get better than that? Because that car is a generation defining hypercar. And where do we go next with the other two? You know, James has learned to fly and <laughs> he's flying against Jeremy in a car across Europe, other than going into space, <laughs> where does he go next, you know? And I, I do remember at that point, you know, and you're obviously, you know, because of the success, you've got to churn out the series because it's starting to make silly money for people and all the merchandise and all the, you know. And so the pressure on the, the thing that has created all the other stuff becomes immense. Um, and, and there's that. It's a, I'm sure it's the same. It, I know it's the same in events. You know, I'm sure Silverstone are going... That was just the best thing ever. How do we top that? You know, Formula One is probably going, how are we going to get another opening lap like that? You know, um, there's that sweet spot moment. And then it's like day after, oh my God, how are we going to, how are we going to do better than that? You know, so it's, um, it's, it's a huge pressure and a different pressure to the startup pressure, if you like. Startup pressure is just, oh, it's kind of, here's our work. I hope you like it. Whereas it's all, it's the different pressure. It's like, oh my God, you do like it. And now I've got to, now we've got to make another 10 of them and they've all got to be good or better. 
you know. And of course, we're, we're in a very competitive industry, or all, all industries are competitive. But you're kind of like, right, we've got to do better. We've got to do better. We've got to keep this going, you know. And it's that moment, whether it's shareholders or, you know, corporation in the sense of BBC, it was like, right, this is now a cash cow. You've just got to keep going. And so that is, a, again, a good problem to have, but it's a problem nonetheless. Because you know? also you had all the other iterations around the world of Top Gear. Did, did, did they involve you much with those in terms of Australia and America, or were they very no, much... I, yeah, they, they did later. They did later. I... I, I um, they started do it, we started doing Top Gear festivals. I'd actually left the program by then. And basically I was, I did a stint and I was burnt out because of that pressure. So I left for a while and then, and then came back. And I, start, I did some um, <clears throat> festivals, which incorporated certainly Australia, the Australian presenters who are fantastic. Um, so we did festivals. So again, you know, you, I came back to another area of, the beast that we created, if you like. So I came back and did yep. the live shows, which mm -hmm. were different and a really good experience, actually fantastic experience, set me up nicely for F1 because it was live and it was, it was lots of moving parts. Um, but yeah, so, so then you end up, this is how big it becomes. You end up in South Africa and there are grandstands full of people going nuts for the presenters. Whereas back in 2002, my first shoot with Richard Hammond, I'd never met him. So we turned up in the morning. It was like, hi, I'm Richard, the presenter. I was like, oh, hi, I'm Jim, the researcher. I set this up, you know, and we, we got on with it. And, and you, this is only, you know, six years later. Yeah. Right, presidential, you know, it's going out and all these, there's crowds of people going nuts. Like they've just seen the Beatles or something, you know, it's <laughs> nuts. So um yeah i've forgotten what the question was now but yeah it, it's uh it was yes uh, yeah the other parts it, it became a global brand and you could it was that was kind of the visual embodiment of oh god this is now global you know it's gone from two blokes on the tube talking about it to there's fifty thousand crumb looking Africans <laughs> loving loving just seeing the presenters you know yeah and and just going into the the adventures over over the years that they're obviously huge pieces. You know, we only see an hour's worth of footage at best on on the specials and and on the you know the segments that you do. Just just explain to people sort of what sort of work went into those in terms of having the initial idea to actually the the end product. So I mean, the, the initial idea is kind of the easy bit. Once we got into the swing of it, you know, you, you realise what works. So if we so if we take the, the 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 races as an example, that first race, we, no one really realised how involved they were. So I took on that first race on my own, and it nearly broke me. <laughs> it was it was it was brilliant at the same time uh, because you have these extraordinary days where it has to happen in like a day. So so you have the idea, and then you've got to plan it all. So it was all timetabling. So take that one, for example, it's just timetabling when they get the train, what time the train would get there. And then, then I'd just do a route thing with an average speed, say of 50 miles an hour, because of course you've got to account for tolls and stops for food and stop, you know, filling up the car, all that kind of stuff. So I, and it was going to be cut. It was going to be close-ish. And so I so but you know get to a couple of races later and then the competition comes out you know I've got Jeremy ringing me from the car going am I going to win this am I going to win this it's like no it's going to be close but you, you know I hopefully you should and so you 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 get into this kind of thing where you have the idea then you do need you need a month just to to get the cars the script needs to be written timetabling the permissions, you know, to, to film in these towns, you know, like Monaco and all that kind of stuff. So that is such a time consuming thing. You can easily eat up four weeks doing that. Then there's the trip itself. So by the time 
I did the first America special, which wasn't going to be a special, but it turned out to be a special because because the mileage involved. I was in Miami for three weeks. You know, I, I traveled from Miami to New Orleans, I think four times to, to recce the route, you know, and find funny things. You know, I found a place called Baghdad on the way, which spelt slightly differently, but that was great, you know, and <clears throat> and then um, there was all sorts of things. And, you know, oh, that Texas sign has got bullet holes in it. Excellent. We'll stop there and all that kind of stuff. And so it, it's all life consuming. You know, you just put you just put your rest of your life on hold and hope that people forgive you when you come back. And um, but then you, you you go and see places that you'd never dream of, of seeing, you know, and so. Um, yeah, they are really intense. But so you film it, let's say that's eight weeks, and then there's another six week edit to pull the stories out, and then it goes on screen and people enjoy it for an hour, and then that's that. You know, you kind of go, oh, right. But with Top Gear, it's completely different because it stays in the consciousness of. Right, it lives on via Dave and all the rest of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Dave, I can watch for a couple of years because it was like reliving <laughs> these experiences. But uh, but now, but now, I, you know, obviously very proud of them. Absolutely. And what what was it like just dealing with sort of when people would find out in you know parties and stuff like that they worked on Top Gear? What what was sort of the the questions you'd get asked? Because it was very people have real passion behind it. Yeah. I mean, to be fair, in the end, I didn't because I would lose an evening to a thousand questions about it. Um, in the end, I'd actually say, oh, I just work in TV. We had a running joke. A few of us used to just say, oh, we fit aerials, fit TVs. So <laughs> we wouldn't be asked. I know that sounds awful. When, you know, the hundredth pe- person asks you what Jeremy Clarkson's like, you're kind of like, I'm, not, I can't, I'm kind of bored of, bored of that. But I know that sounds like a spoiled child, but it, it, it's relentless. It, <laughs> You know, once the fan base kicks in, it's, um, it's yeah, it's all-consuming because everyone's got an opinion, you know. In the, I'm sure, Simon, you have the same with Theo because television is such a thing where, and you're probably all doing it now, watching me, you're probably going, oh, look at that show off with his air conditioning. You know, you immediately have an opinion on someone as soon as you as, as soon as you put yourself out into the space you'll have an opinion and you'll be pigeonholed or you'll or or you know and i'm sure for theo it was exactly the same making that transition from businessman to kind of personality if you like yeah yeah it was um it was strange when you spend a lot of time with him uh you walk around and you think why is everyone looking at me uh, it's, it's that it's that same like you say you 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 uh, have to become very conscious of what you've done. And it's interesting, Jim, like you say, I, I, I remember talking to my friends about Top Gear and the episode the night before, you know, it was always the talk of school. I'm showing my, my age at this point. Uh, <laughs> I've these guys. Um, so, uh, uh, but um, it was always the talk kind of of school and it would be, oh yeah, well, it was a brilliant race, but oh, it wasn't as good as that one or it wasn't as good as that one or something similar which was incredibly harsh on like you say the the 16 weeks or so that's gone into pulling all this together uh but instantly it would be oh well, yeah great episode but um didn't never, never quite beat that train one uh but uh, yeah it's um uh yeah you're right that there's always a uh everyone's a critic aren't they especially when it comes to tv yeah absolutely so, so Jim, in your opinion, why why did Top Gear work? Those those, those years, the the, the the classic years, I suppose we'd call them. Why, why did that work? Um, it, I think it worked really because it. So we knew our audience because we were all car geeks. So it wasn't like a normal program where I don't know. I get a job on Strictly Come Dancing. I know nothing about dancing, but I know how to make a VT. So I'll do a beginning, middle and an end and I'll, you know, learn about dancing along the way. Whereas was this, it was like every single person on that crew was passionate about the, um, the subject area. And, and, and so with that, you know what 
you'd want to watch because you're mm. you're the audience. I think the the other the other big thing for me was, and this sat, might come across awful, but um, male skewing television at that point wasn't being serviced, if you like. So um, the programs of, of that time in that kind of early to mid noughties, we call it, no, noughties, yeah. noughties. Yeah. It was quite, it was quite, um, because, and I'm not saying this, in, I don't want to be, you know, it's come across as arrogant or sexist, but essentially, and we were taught this at the time when, when I did those um, uh, brainstorming ideas, the research says that the woman of the household has control of the remote control. And that's, that's apparently what has come out of the research, their research into viewing habits. So what I think happened was we took a quite male subject and we made it entertaining and entertaining enough that the whole family could watch, that, 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 the, that everyone in the lounge, if you like, got something from it. You got a celeb interview, you got fun with cars rather than how many carburettors and all that kind of stuff. But you got just enough for the car geek. So in the hour, I always used to think, well, the woman will, will, so this is very stereotypical, but, but someone in the lounge might go and put the kettle on whilst the supercar's being tested on the track. Then someone else might go, oh, I'll go and, whilst the celeb interview's on, because I'm not interested in that person, I'll go and get some biscuits or something like that. So it was that kind of variety of stuff that everyone got something from it. I think, mm -hmm. so the initial pull was Top Gear's back, it's cars, we haven't really had it. Fifth Gear was doing decent numbers, by the way. It was still chugging away. It was, yeah, it's a good show. But it was, we had a point of difference. And so I think that was really the success in that we made a car program entertaining enough that everyone was happy to watch it. So you kind of go, <clears throat> and also I think there's always, I think we've all done it, haven't we? It's all kind of like, oh, I'll let you watch your Top Gear uh, and then I score points back so I can watch my program later because I let you watch Top Gear. But actually secretly, I don't mind watching Top Gear. You know, we've all done it. It's kind of like, all right, I'll let you watch the Home Improvements program. So I've got one in the bank so I can watch Match of the Day. You know, I, I don't want to come across as being really stereotypical, but I think we've all kind of done it. So it, I think that's where, where it crossed over, if you like. Yeah. And I think the other thing, I mean, I found this particularly in, uh, in lockdown and, and watching things like, you know, You'd be switching TV on with Dave and stuff. You'd actually be seeing these beautiful um, places that you went and visited, you know, all around the world. And as I say, having not watched them for a couple of years and then re-watching them, particularly as you're stuck in your house, it was actually quite a nice escapism to watch all these beautiful places that we now can't go to. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a huge, that's something that isn't said enough. It's quite funny because my, my other half's mum, Whenever we used to go, oh, what did you think of that? She was like, oh, I really like the views. And, and it's right. It's like, it's like um, wildlife programs, you know? You watch wildlife programs because you know you're going to be transported to this extraordinary place that you're probably never going to go to yourself. It's the same, same kind of deal, just with huge carbon footprint. Sorry. <laughs> you know? So let's go on to, so, so obviously Top Gear has been a massive success. And then obviously um, there, there, was a, there was an altercation. That, but then they, they started the, what you would now call the, the new Top Gear or probably like Generation 2 of Top Gear if it's on like Generation 4 now, if you like. Mm. Um, you actually stayed for that period. How different was that? from uh, on two areas one now you obviously had social media very much in the forefront and you actually had a show that had to live up to the your previous show but with a completely different cast and and, and, and crew sort of well, maybe not crew but cast yeah. how 
how how different was that? Because we talk about a lot, you know, learning from failure and without being too unkind, that would probably be perceived as a failure um, on, on that side. It, it took a few bits to get, get back through. But, but how did you, what did you learn from that experience that you now put into your own production company Wiser Films? Yeah, I think um, that was interesting. Um, I was lucky enough to be asked by both productions um, and um, I chose Top Gear because it was just, that was, I felt like it was my show, you know, I felt like that I'd helped to create it. And I thought that um, no one should be bigger than the club, if you like. So I thought, yeah, I'll go, you know, Andy called me about Grand Tour and I, you know, I'm really grateful for, it, for that call because that was lovely to get, you know, just from a ego point of view, it was nice. And it was nice to be asked by both, both productions. So in a weird way, you know, we're talking about building a brand and everything. I, I had a loyalty to the brand that I felt I kind of helped mm. on the way. And the pressure in the, it was the absolute polar opposite of what I, what I described earlier. I was 15 years older. I had more responsibility, I felt, to deliver this thing. And I think everyone felt it. And, but the pressure was different because of course we were living up to what had gone before. Whereas before it was kind of, there was no social media the show had fizzled out, so anything that, that did better than the last iteration would be deemed a success. And then there's the P. Diddy, Mo, Mo Money, Mo Problems thing, where the press and social media are all over it. I mean, to the point where um, I said, I, when we were looking for presenters, I mentioned someone who I'd worked with in... Australia, like I was saying, when I did the live things. And the next day, it was on the front page of the Daily Star or something. Mm. Like, how, how has that happened? You know, it's like, and, and, and what the real item for me was kind of press intrusion and how that works and how that must be some kind of tapping. or And then you become paranoid about what you're going to say in the office because it's going to, because literally something that I said, oh, what about this? It was a, it was a female, because we, we felt that we needed a female presenter. And we, uh, thankfully we had the now late Sabine Schmitz, which is absolutely um, awful what's happened. Um, she passed away earlier this year. Um, but, you know, we were looking at different female, female presenters. And I thought, well, Rihanna in, in Australia is great you know she does V8 supercars she, she's got great you know she's really great banter and to have that then Aussie Jezza's Aussie girl gonna present on in literally what felt like the next day so the pressure was completely different and and completely much 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 harder much harder and then of course the program goes out and goes down like the proverbial horse poo sandwich. And, um, and then there's social media, it's just reams of this is rubbish, this is rubbish, I hate it, I hate you, hate everything, hate, 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 hate. And so it's an extra pressure that we didn't have. And, and but the big learning, and Simon and I were just talking about this beforehand, is it's actually more useful to have failure than constant success because you iron out the problems. You know, if you just had success, 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 and to be fair, after the first couple of series, we kind of did for a bit with Top Gear. You're not really learning much. You're just recycling what works. And um, this was a huge... And, and they're now at the point where they've got the presenting team right. People like them. You know, they're, make, they're making great-looking films. Um, they've moved it to... BBC One, which they always wanted to do back in the day, but Andy Wilman always resisted it um, for whatever reason. But I think moving to BBC One has been a great, great thing. 
for the show. And I think, you know, it's, you're right, it's, it's uh, version 4.0 or whatever it is now, you know, which, which works. And, and same with any business, I'm sure, Simon, you know. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, like you say, we, we discussed this earlier, you learn an awful lot from failure. Um, and failure is not necessarily ever really a, a bad thing if you can still pick yourself up and go again. Um, you mentioned actually the BBC show. I think I uh, almost got a little bit lethargic because uh, it felt like, like you said, you know, we've flown a plane with one of the presenters against the Bugatti. Where the hell do we go from here? Um, and I think sometimes, you know, businesses feel, feel that kind of same way as how do we keep evolving? How do we keep moving forward? And I think there was always going to be that inevitable backlash or drop off or whatever you wanted to call it. Um, I think there were some, you know, you've mentioned uh, uh, that there were some decisions as well that uh, were, maybe wouldn't be made again. Uh, but as long as you learn from it and move forward, and I think that's exactly what Top Gear has done, which is fantastic. Um, they've evolved again. They've now got a format. They've now got a show. They've now got the talent uh, to, to build on the success. Uh, and they're building new audiences with new people um, as well uh, and find, finding, finding their USP again. Uh, but uh, yes, it's, uh, you know, we, we mentioned it earlier, kind of test, learn, test again, find your audience and then find what makes them tick and then keep, keep going. Uh, but there's always going to be that evolution that needs to happen. Uh, and I think often, uh, often people do rest on their laurels uh, a little bit and you've seen it in the world of business at the moment the, the pandemic has shaken things up like it's never been before um, there are certain businesses um, let's say uh, the Arcadia group which is one I know re relatively well for example uh, they didn't invest in e-commerce they didn't invest in what was going to be the savior for pretty much every single business during this time uh, some identified that straight away and got off the back of it. Some were already at the forefront and they're already the leaders in that area and they got the gains. Um, but those who stood still uh, have got an absolute nightmare to deal with at the moment. If not, they've already disappeared. Uh, but like you say, it's, uh, it's, it's evolution. It's uh, learning from your mistakes and trying not to make the same again. Absolutely. So, Simon, have we got any questions that have come through from, from people to, to ask Jim before we, before we yeah, move well, on? I think, I, think there's a, I think we touched on it earlier, but, but I like this one. It's, um, uh, at what point did you notice, uh, Jim, that, wow, we have something special here with Togia? Yeah, I think, I think it was um, around the kind of third series where the cat suddenly captain slow became a thing and you're kind of like oh okay um and yeah it was kind of the characters the caricatures of themselves were coming through so they're just kind of amped versions of themselves that was that was the moment i kind of thought okay and also suddenly so from struggling to find celebs to do the show it was oh no we're not going to have him or her we want you know we've had we've had mm -hmm. not this person you know mm -hmm. so it went it went round because i used to direct the track so um i used to meet you know i used to do the timings and the um and direct the cameras around around the track and it was really interesting the change when slightly bigger names but in more enthusiastic people it wasn't like oh i'm gonna i'm doing another chat show to promote my show it was oh i'm gonna get a track day out of this and i, I really want to go top of the times you know and and that was a really interesting thing as to who would listen to coaching and stig and who was perhaps egotistical enough to go I've got this you know and they would overdrive the car and not go as fast as they hoped you know and when you start to get you know little meltdowns that they're not fastest or that they're, they're not faster than their celebrity mate who's already been on then I think that's the moment you realize okay we've got something here yeah 
you know, this is quite a competition. Because I remember with the F1 drivers, it all became very much sort of who actually in the same car can be the fastest. Yeah. And I think you had Lewis Hamilton on about three times in the end trying to <laughs> keep on going faster and faster. Was, yeah, it was Nigel Mansell for me. He was, um, yeah. It will probably sue me if I say the story of Nigel Mansell, so I won't, but a deeply, deeply competitive man. And um, he was, but to be fair, he was, he was extraordinary. You know, you, it's weird because you, you see people having a, having a go each week in the Liana and then you see someone who is absolutely world class and you just go, it was kind of him and Mark Webber actually, who was there in the wet, who was still at Williams at that point. I remember just thinking, oh, my God, that is car control off scale, you know. And, um, yeah, it was, um, yeah, it's an eye-opener because that car, you know, it need, that car needed to be driven. Yeah, it was, it, it was, it was a, it, it was all right, obviously, but it, it, it you know, and then, then you get the other ones that go, oh, can I put a bit of tyre pressure in the back tyres? And you have to shut them down. <laughs> you can't go, no, it's got to be an equal playing field for everyone. And, um, did, you no did, we, time, so. did you ever have a go, Jim? Did you got a time on the board? No, no, never, <laughs> no. That was the thing. It was kind of like there was always this promise that one year we'd all set a time for the, a you know, rap party or whatever, but it never happened. It was always too busy. It was always like, no, on to the next thing, on to the next thing, you know. Um, but I certainly sweeped the track a lot. I drove around slowly sweeping stones and things and, uh, yeah, but never actually, no, never actually set a time. I know. Deep, deeply regret that. <laughs> Um, and Simon, let, let's come over to you, um, and we'll, we'll, we'll come back to Jim in a session in a second and talk about sort of Formula One and, and, and the car years. But but Simon, let, let's come to you. Obviously, as part of your job, we touched on this earlier. You worked for Ryman for many years, but part of your job was working with the entrepreneurs that Theo Pathetas invested in on Dragon's Den. What? That must have been very interesting because we obviously see a TV show. But but what was that like? afterwards when the people had got their investment um and and sort of were, were moving through their their entrepreneurial journey what what sort of lessons did you take from that that you now put into to your own business charlesy yeah yeah it was it was an absolutely fascinating time and um uh, it, it, to dragon's den was a tv show and i think that's the one thing that was always very interesting is uh, uh a lot of uh, for a lot of the people who got investment, they saw Dragon's Den as the end of the journey, not the beginning. <laughs> and and I think uh, my job was sadly sometimes to try and bring these people back down to earth with a thud as to, okay, you've got investment now. Now we're in partnership. Now we have a business. Let's get to work. And now you're going to work harder than you ever have before. You you thought, uh, yeah, getting the investment was when you made it. But no, that's never the case. We had something called uh, uh, Dragon's Den Syndrome that we often saw that when there was uh, these people received investment, all of a sudden you'd turn up at their offices and this time they'd have a nicer chair and a nicer desk and maybe a nicer car. Um, and you would have to say, no, 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 now's, uh, now it's time to work. Um, now... Uh, my role and what what I tried to do was offer support to these businesses as much as possible, similar to what it is that I do now with my clients. Um, and often that just, it was trying to break down their business into the simplest version that it can possibly be. It's, it's asking why. My job was always to kind of ask why and question and say, okay, why will customers come to you versus your competition? What makes you different? What's is going to define what your business is, what defines what your brand is. Um, and if you ask those questions regularly enough, uh, there's, there's something that you need that you learn in kind of a business course is, the, I think they call it the five whys. Just keep asking yourself why, keep being inquisitive. Uh, I think that's an absolutely key part to business. Um, and sometimes people need external help coming in to say, why um, and sometimes you get good in, in your own routine of doing it yourself um, 
but you have to always like we've discussed earlier kind of keep evolving and part of that is asking why am i still relevant why is my brand still relevant why are my customers using me why will they continue to use me in the future um yeah and uh, how do i ensure that's that's the tactical action you then take how do i ensure that i continue to retain them um so that was probably one of the main learnings that I had uh, whilst working uh, working with these businesses is that often business is simple. Uh, it's people that confuse it. <laughs> um, so, and if you just ask yourself all the right questions, you will usually get to the right answer. Uh, the problem is, is in this day and age, you know, we've mentioned social media, we've mentioned everything else. How do you have that clarity of thought to sit down every now and then and go, ask yourself those questions and really think them through and be honest with yourself with the answers. Yeah, and I think I think you're right. And what you're saying there is in terms of and we've touched on the, 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 the failure aspect as well. And, and a phrase I always like is it's not failure, it's feedback, which is very true, because in terms of you have to always question why did that go wrong? And how, how can you if I can't stop there and say, well, it didn't work. OK, that's that's it sort of thing. But the other thing with that, and we see it particularly on the motorsport side, is the truly successful teams in motorsport, the ones that win, they ask, why are they winning? Not sort of, are they actually, um, you know, you can get very complacent and very, very almost arrogant into that. And, and I'm sure Jim probably found this with Top Gear that you start feeling that you can do anything, any challenge, anything. And at some point, someone is going to say stop because the next one will come up. You, you, you touched there on um, fifth gear, Jim. I remember when top gear, old top gear left, fifth gear came on board and it was quite a refreshing sort of, even though it was with the same presenters, it really moved it forward. And everyone's going, oh, top gear, that old hat, you know, I'm, I'm watching channel five or whatever it was on. But, but it was interesting then how Top Gear then came back and over a couple of years, people started forgetting about Fifth Gear and actually you start, you, you tune into Fifth Gear occasionally and you'd see they were trying to do what you guys were doing on Top Gear by being a bit more at the track. And so it goes in complete circles where you, you could argue that Fifth Gear should have been always questioning, well, why, why aren't we, you know, where are we getting to? What are we doing? How can we evolve? But they may have done that just a bit too late. And you could argue probably that old Top Gear did that a bit too late. Um, it, I, I think that's the, that's the trick. When you, see, when you see teams like Mercedes in Formula One, the reason they have won seven world championships on the bat is because it's never good enough and it's always the next thing how do we do it that that assessment process afterwards and i think that's really key to bring into businesses is the constant evolution um you know and I, i've gone into businesses with um you know an hr hat on and it's incredible how many people don't really know either what success looks like or how they got to they'll say oh well in 2012 we got to a turnover of 60 million brilliant and you think well that's now eight years ago nine years ago what did you do then that made I don't know we, it just seemed to the lights turned on and then afterwards the lights turned off sort of thing so it is about understanding yeah I, I, I was lucky, from. yeah I was lucky enough to I was doing some filming at Mercedes F1 and I happened to be in on a meeting we had to switch the cameras off obviously because they don't want to, they want to see it but this new part had come in and this is when they're at this is only three years ago when they were utterly dominant when the um, hybrid turbos came out. I remember the guy going, looking at this new drawing of this part, which I had no idea what it was. And he just went, oh, that's good. That's going to be a lot better because the part that part at the moment is rubbish. And I'm like, no, it's not. You're, you're, winning, you're winning everything, you know. And so, yeah. right, that mindset is, is got to be better yeah how can we, how can we get better it's a brutal they call it a brutal transparency we we ran a session with mercedes a couple of months ago for one of our clients and, and we had a guest speaker from mercedes and the session was they talked around psychological safety and and this you know being able to have this ability to really question stuff but without being rude just saying well this isn't good enough rather than oh i suppose it's good enough but what was really interesting is after the session 
um, I, you know, obviously emailed the guy, thanks very much for coming and everything. And I had a critique of my performance, <laughs> which you initially you think, oh, that's, well, hang on. But you learn from it and you know for the next session, actually the areas you can work on. And there was nothing too detrimental there. I was really pleased to report, but it was the little things. It was the little things. If you do this, you do that, that will stick better. That will, you're thinking, well, this is top advice actually. And it improves, it improves, it improves. Because that's all that you can do is improve from those, improve yeah, from mean, those areas. Yeah, I think also it's kind of like that. You have got to switch off the emotions sometimes. And I reckon, yeah. obviously, Simon, with, with the entrepreneurs who are quite pleased with themselves, they did quite well on, you know, there's, there's, there's can your ego take the, the, the criticism? Yeah, and I think you're trying to, trying to put yourself in other people's shoes and trying to ask yourself the tough questions. Uh, I, I don't know, I, I look at the entrepreneurs that I've worked with and the, the people that have been in a room and they, they, they get their kicks from doing things that no one else has ever done. They get their kicks from always being better and constant improvement. Uh, the, the people you meet who will settle and will be happy with what they've currently got and not in the same league <laughs> as these people um uh but part of that comes with like you say ask asking yourself the really tough questions uh and being able to uh stand up to those um as well it's it's a very tricky kind of skill to learn um and it's a it's a tough tough uh, uh tough uh, conversation almost to have with yourself sometimes but it's being that self-aware and never letting yourself settle yeah absolutely and simon what what sort of advice are you giving to your clients at the moment in terms of coming out of lockdown? Um, what, what, what sort you know, the, the, the digital side on marketing is, is key at the moment as we haven't been able to meet face to face. What are the sort of advice that you're giving clients at the moment and working on? Sure. Um, so uh, firstly, there's kind of coming back to what we've discussed earlier on. It's the, the why, asking yourself why. Why should your customers be dealing with you now? Why should they be dealing with yourselves in the future? I think um, uh, I've, I've just come into working uh, with a recruitment company. Um, they're a very established business. They're fantastic at what they do, uh, but they've never really spent an awful lot of time looking at their marketing. Now they want to go to the next step, um, but they've never really sat down and thought, you know, what is, what is it that makes us us? Uh, so when you look at their website, when you meet them in person, they couldn't be two more different views of a business. Um, so I'm helping them at the moment in terms of defining what their brand should be in the future. Um, so taking that time to ask what it is that you are going to be, uh, then building the brand around it and then ensuring that you have brand consistency is kind of a key part of uh, a key part of the strategy. And then after that, you mentioned, you know, the, the, there are more marketing channels available to us now than there ever have been. Uh, I know it's a, it's a cliche, <laughs> cliche thing to say, because that will always be the case. But um, you've got to find the right approach for your business. Now we're uh, kind of in a room here. There's an awful lot of us who will uh, be just going on referrals. A lot of my clients refer me. That's fantastic. That's kind of a marketing approach for, for my business. Uh, but when you're talking about larger scale uh, businesses, when you're talking about Top Gear, you know, Top Gear, it's a, uh, the PR side of it is absolutely ginormous. How do you ensure that you are being talked about on newspapers? Hopefully in a good way. <laughs> not, uh, not, uh, yeah, them, them getting access to uh, Jim's meetings and Jim's thoughts. Um, but, um, uh for others it will be uh right how do we get on social media how do we advertise on social media how do we find that hook that grabs people on a feed and pulls them across onto our website there's no one easy answer to all of this uh it is simply and i'll come back to it again and again test and learn test and learn get yourself on as many marketing channels as possible see what works for you, take a look at the data that comes back from it, and then go again. Um, and if it's not working, that's when you have to ask yourself as to, okay, do we have a good enough hook? Do people want to work with us like we think they want to work with us? 
or do we need to find a different way to market ourselves in those channels? And as you do that, you'll evolve and you'll learn. Um, a number of my clients, the first thing that I do is just get them on as many marketing channels as possible. We will make some educated guesses on what we think will be the best approaches. And then from there, it's all about just looking at the data and saying what worked and what didn't. And then if something works, that's not the then, okay, wonderful, everyone put your arms up in the air. How do we then make that better? Um, and uh, yeah, like I say, there's, for, for everyone who's kind of watching this, there's going to be different approaches that work. Um, the only thing I would say at the moment that is fantastic is uh, Google My Business. Google My Business is basically the most, the best free advertising you can currently get right now. Um, Google, with all its, its algorithms and all of its metrics, and uh, Google's listening into my conversations. They just asked me if I needed there's anything. No chance of snow. <laughs> Typical. Right. Go away, Google. Um, so. Uh, uh, now we know how uh, Jim's Jim's wants to get into the news. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm gonna chuck it out the chuck it out the door. Um, so, yeah, Google My Business. If you have a premises, um, if you have any sort of physical location, you can get reviews up against your business used by utilizing Google My Business. You can also tell them what kind of services you offer, and when people are searching on Google they will have a more likelihood of finding you. It's something we went through at Ryman. We tried to get all of our 210 locations to have good reviews up against their names just because it helps with your SEO so much. That at the moment is completely free. <laughs> and uh, whereas all the other marketing channels I'll talk about will uh, usually cost some sort of money at some point, especially when you start advertising. Google My Business is the only one at the moment that's free that I'll push all of my clients towards. No, absolutely. No, it's, it's really useful to know actually what, because there is so much out there at the moment to uh, quote unquote assist and help businesses and entrepreneurs. That it's actually good to, to get your advice on actually what works and what doesn't work. Um, so that's great. So Jim, just coming back, back to you, um, since Top Gear, obviously you've worked on the both BBC and Channel 4 F1 coverage. What what's that like? The the sort of the the get live pressure. You touched on it earlier with the Top Gear live. But, but what's that like? You know, you've got a show. It's going out to millions, but there's no post production. It's it's going out live. Yeah, I mean, I was I was making so actually the production process that I kind of described earlier is just squeezed into three days. So it's an unbelievably fascinating and challenging discipline in that you would get there on <clears throat> the Thursday and you get access to drivers and the track and things like that. You'd shoot your stuff. So you, the weekend, the Grand Prix weekend for us as DT producers, directors, was basically you had this most wonderful experience on the Thursday where you have access to everything. And then you disappear into a box for the next 48 hours trying to turn around what you've just shot. Um, and um, in, a, in a media pen in the middle of the track, you know, I remember I, did, I was lucky enough to go to Interlagos, which was um, one of my all time favorite tracks, which I was always thought, oh, I'll never get to go there. And uh, you've got all the drama of going through the favela and all of that kind of stuff. and being told don't wear any watches and don't don't do anything silly and then you're in the circuit and then yeah and then had this most amazing time at into the Argos shooting drivers and pieces and in the pit lane and in the paddock on this iconic track and then I went into a very sweaty metal box in Brazil and and edited for, for three days uh, and then you spit out what you've done and I remember we were making changes because we were doing the closing VT. So you're pulling stuff from the race as it happens and, you know, music track and whatever. And you're constantly trying to make it better throughout to the point where we fired it out. So basically we made some changes. You, you play it into this machine called EVS, which then spits it out on air. And we were so close. We, kind of pressed spacebar on the edit and it was going out 
our last edit was go the start of our edit was going out as we put in the so we put in the last changes about a minute before air sent it to evs so it was being played out from the suite and then going straight into evs and straight on air so if the computer crashed the program would crash so you're kind of like this but, but you want to make it as best as you can you know you want to make it as good as you possibly can and so we took the gamble on yeah we've got another version ready they had our previous version already in evs so we went let's do it and so you get immediate rewards with that as well because it's live i used to remember just putting hashtag pvc f1 you know and getting instant feedback on the opening vt that um had just gone out almost as it's going out you know this is rubbish this is great nothing in between <laughs> And um, moving on to, uh, obviously, you now uh, run Wiser Films, your own yep. production company. Um, we've had the car years. We're, we're currently on, we had episode three and four uh, last night, which, as we touched on earlier, episode four in particular, the, the Lotus versus the Ferrari, Bond versus Magnum PI. Yep. How have you taken all these lessons and put them into your own business and, and talk a bit more about sort of the projects that you're working on? Yeah, I think the car years is an interesting one because obviously it's all the learnings from the past 20 years of filming cars and trying to know what the audience might like. And again, trying to make it a bit broader, like we've got these kind of cultural icons of last night. And so this is really interesting. I'm loving Simon's input because we're obviously trying to build a brand with the car years. So, um, and Simon's absolutely right. We're just trying to build it online so that there's becomes a bit of a fan base. Because obviously we're on ITV4, which is great, and it has its it has its audience. So if you can, you obviously inherit a audience for the channel. So what you've got to do is build that audience incrementally per series. So, so you know, uh, social media bad in some ways but social media great in other ways and again it's like the comments you get on it, it there's nothing in the middle it's either utterly fantastic or awful and so if you can build that audience that fan base which is what we're trying to do then you bring an audience to an audience that's already there if that makes sense mm. so you, you you you're you, you know there's a slot average so yeah. you know we're doing well i don't always appears a show off if you do it but there's a slot average of like 100 120 or thousand on on itv4 and last week we got 270 so that's fantastic mm. so, um it's it's growing that audience and getting the recognition of the brand and from my experience i know that's not going to happen overnight and i think that that's a mistake that a lot of people make in that I'm going to do this great thing. Here it is. No one's watched it. Oh, I'm going to stop. No. You know, I've experienced it with a couple of people just starting YouTube channels. Mm. Any business, it's a four-year plan. You know, it's, if you're still going in four years, then pat yourself on the back because you've beaten the odds. So it's one of those things where we're starting to create an audience and that's great, but it's always a work in progress. And again, I'll be sitting down with people at the end of the series and go, all right, which ones worked, which didn't, which, what, how can we tweak it to get, to make it more entertaining and all that kind of stuff. Plus all the, all the business side of getting the funding together because mm -hmm. the funding model is completely different. You know, we, 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 we bring in a bumper sponsor, our sponsors, Adrian Flux, this series, and they've been fantastic. I mean, they've been unbelievably good online in terms of their social. Um, and that's, that's been a real blessing this series. And we shot the show out in um, Northern Ireland as well. So again, we're starting to get the vistas people like, you know, we've, we've learned that from the past. The first series is always see how this works, you know, and we shot it in the new forest and that was great. And we got, right, we need something different. And, um, we, we went to Northern Ireland because we could in the pandemic. It's the only, you know, it's like 
Scotland, Northern Ireland, Wales. We went Northern Ireland, you know, and um, it seems to be working well. Yeah. Brilliant. No, brilliant. And and for people who haven't seen that yet, it's on the ITV hub, isn't it? It is. Yeah. Uh, remember, search the car years. It's under T, not C, but never mind. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, it's um, yeah, they're fun shows. They're fun shows. And uh, I'm yeah, I'm proud of what we've done. And obviously, shooting in the pandemic was mm-hmm. made things incredibly difficult. But, you know, we're all in the same boat there. There's not an industry that isn't affected by that. But, it, mm-hmm. you know, it's that extra pressure on top of everything normal that's um you know, we, we committed the cost to go to Northern Ireland and we knew as a business, if one of the presenters came down with it, that's us done. That's probably us bankrupt. You know, it's the, those kind of, those kind of, you've kind of got to go. There's a point where you just got, we've just got to hope for the best. And I think that's the same. You look at the British Grand Prix, they must have been, and I know having worked on Goodwood a couple of weeks ago, I know that they were sweating on it as well. And you kind of, the event industry obviously has been hugely affected and it's great to see that, you know, they can survive another year. And um, yeah, obviously we're all in the same boat. But, um, yeah, it's been challenging, but, but great. I'm really proud of the shows and um, that's all you can do, you know. Yeah. No, because another one, of course, um, which is on the ITV hub, is your work on the Goodwood Festival of Speed with Corinne Chanduk, the uh, maestros of motorsport. That was fantastic. Yeah, that was great. I mean, God, that was just like, um, yeah, it was like a holiday. <laughs> it was great. It was, I got to meet, you know, Damon Hill, Jackie Stewart, Mario Andretti. You know, it's, um, yeah, for, for me as a F1 fan, it's kind of and 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 Karun is exactly the same and that's what's great you know every time I way to him his shot was like you know he couldn't believe that he was he was in the company of all these people as well so it's 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 good it's uh, yeah I was pleased with those brilliant excellent well I think that draws today to a close um you know thank you both Jim and Simon um just in terms of uh if people want to find out more about your respective businesses and, and TV shows. Simon, why don't you tell us where people can find out more about Charlesy? Yeah, sure. Uh, so my website is charlesy.com um, or if you do want to have a chat with me, feel free to get, get in touch with Nick or uh, find me on LinkedIn under Simon Childs. Um, so yeah, oh. and you can find out a bit more about the my business and what I do. So it's mainly kind of a uh, yeah, dig- digital marketing consultancy, marketing and brand consultancy, uh, website design and media production. Uh, not quite to the levels of Jim, uh, but, uh, you know, case studies and care, customer testimonials and things like that. And every now and then I fly a drone around, but really that's just because I want to. <laughs> and, and if people want to see your work, they're actually on it right now. The, the e-ignition virtual learning platform and the ignition website was all designed and built by Simon. So um, certainly from our point of view, we've had a hugely successful um, partnership. And uh, yeah, literally we would not we would not be delivering this to you if it wasn't for Simon's work. So you can definitely see how, what it all looks like and, and how it works. But yeah, definitely go over to charlesy.com and see the other people that he's worked with because there's some great examples and case studies there. And, and Jim, from, from your point of view, um, as we said, Car Years ITV4, that continues next Monday at, at eight o'clock. Um, so obviously we want to get some people tuning into that as well. Yeah, yeah. No, please do. Our website's uh, wiserfilms.co.uk and um, you'll see on there that we, we, we make... We're, we're not just cars. We do basically, we want to be just good stories. So uh, we, we make documentaries as well. We've got our first feature documentary in production and um, yeah, hopefully some more car years and some other interesting stuff coming up. But yeah, we're on wiserfilms.co.uk and um, yeah, work with brands as well. We work with the Fast and Furious franchise and um, yeah, we well, um, no, no job too small. <laughs> no, that's great. Um, and of course, um, from our point of view, obviously, please do feel free to stay 
on uh, the, the virtual learning platform. We've got some great videos from Jim's showreel. We've got the original Top Gear DB9 uh, challenge race. Uh, and, and some few other pieces that Jim's worked on as well. So please do stick around and, and, and look at those uh, videos. There's some great, great work there. Um, and, you know, continue to follow Ignition Perform on Instagram. Um, and, you know, if we can be of any assistance, please do let us know. But thanks to everyone who tuned in. My thanks to Jim and Simon. It's been great to talk about um, you know, some, some great TV shows from, from my, I won't quite say childhood, but sort of oh, 20s, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> um, and, um, and yeah, so if, if, if either of these guys can be any assistance or we can, please, please do let us know. But um, really appreciate it. I hope everyone enjoys the, uh, the sun, continues to enjoy the sun while we've still got it. Um, and uh, yeah, just, just thank you for tuning in and uh, enjoy the rest of your Tuesday.